Hello and welcome back to another video. So the XX70 and XX70E motherboards are here, as are the Ryzen 7000 CPUs. So that can only mean one thing, I'm going to be showing you how to put them together to make a PC. For the motherboard I'm going to be using the ASRock XX70E Phantom Gaming Lightning. So this is actually one of the cheapest X670E motherboards you can buy at the moment and I've already done a full unboxing and overview of the motherboard so you want to find out more about that you'll find a link to that in the description. Um, key features we've got now DDR5 and we've also got PCIe Gen 5 for our M.2 and our graphics card. So this is our new M5 socket. You'll notice we've got a little triangle at the top left hand side of the socket cover. So to open our socket cover we're going to need to push this lever down and then bring it all the way towards the middle of the motherboard and then we should be able to open the socket cover. You'll notice that the pins are now on the socket rather than on the bottom of the CPU and if we look at the top left hand side you'll notice we've got a little triangle which we're going to line up with a mark on our CPU. So this is on Ryzen 9 7900X which is a 12 core CPU with 24 threads and a boost clock of up to 5.6 GHz. You'll notice we've got a gold triangle at the top left hand side of the CPU which is going to line up with the triangle on our socket and if we turn the CPU over you'll notice we don't have any pins on the other side of it. So to install our CPU all we need to do is set it into the socket, there's notches in the top and the bottom which line up with notches on the CPU and the gold triangle at the top left of the CPU matching up with the gold triangle at the top left of the socket. Next we can close the socket cover down and then we just need to close the lever and as we do this black bit of plastic should pop off and then we'll put it into the motherboard box for safekeeping. For storage I'm going to be using a single Gen 4 NVMe M.2 drive from Team Group. It's the T-Force Cardia A440 Pro in 1TB capacity. So our motherboard has 4 M.2 drive slots. That one is a Gen 5x4 slot. Then we've got a Gen 4x4 slot, a Gen 4x2 slot and a Gen 3x4 slot. So because we've got a Gen 4 drive we're going to get 4 PCI aliens in the bottom slot so this is where we should install it. Our heatsink is held on with 2 screws, we'll get them removed. To install our M.2 drive all we need to do is insert it into the slot at a slight angle. Then we can secure our drive into place with the screw from the motherboard box. So you can see our drive comes with this really beefy heatsink. If yours doesn't you can simply put the original motherboard heatsink back into place. For RAM I've got 32GB of Kingston Fury Beast at 5200MHz. To install our RAM we're going to need to open the clips on the second and fourth slot along from the CPU. Then we can line our RAM up with the slots. Once we're happy everything's lined up correctly, it's just some firm pressure to the RAM and it's going to clip into place. And then the same thing with our second stick. For the CPU cutter, I'm going to be using BeQuant Stark Rock Pro 4. First thing to do is remove the clips from the back plate. So if we turn the motherboard over, you'll notice the back plate is no longer removable because it's actually screwed in to the motherboard. So although the spacing of these holes and the brackets that we have taken off are the same as for AM4, not every AM4 cooler is going to be compatible with an AM5 socket. So any of the ones where you have to change the back plate shouldn't fit, but most of the ones where you can use the existing motherboard back plate should work okay. And I've checked on BeQuant's website and our Dark Rook Pro 4 is compatible. The ones that aren't compatible you should be able to pick up an upgrade kit from the manufacturer. So we've got one of these spacers to go onto each corner. Then we've got one of these brackets to go on at the top and the bottom. There's two holes in each bracket. We're going to want to put the screw through the one labelled AM4 and then lower it down to the motherboard. Then we can add some thermal paste to the centre of the CPU. Before we install our CPU cutter we're going to need to remove these screw covers. And then before we lower our cutter down into place we're just going to slide this bracket in underneath. We can then set our CPU cutter into place lining it up with the bracket beneath. And then we're going to want to pass the screwdriver that came with the cutter through the hole at the top. Pick up a screw, pass it down through the bracket beneath and get it screwed into place. And then the same thing at the top of the motherboard. And then we can replace the screw caps. We can then set our front fan into place. And then going to pass the clips through the hole on the fan. And then line the fan up with the bracket. And all we're going to do is apply a little bit of pressure to get the clips to go on to the heatsink. And then the same thing on the other side of the RAM. We pass the clips through the heatsink. And then again it's just a little bit of pressure here to get them to clip into place. Making sure the fan's in the same orientation as our front fan, we can then slide our middle fan through the gap between the heat sinks. And then we'll get it secured into place with the clips. Then we need to plug the cable coming from the fans into the double splitter cable. 
At the top of the motherboard, we've got our two CPU fan headers. The one at the top is for a water pump, and our CPU fan header is actually the one closest to the heat sink. So we're gonna to need to plug the double splitter cable into here. And then we can just tuck the excess cables in under the heat sink. For the case, I'm gonna use the Lian Li Lan Cool 3, and I've already done a full build guide in this case where I'll go through absolutely everything in detail. So for today, I'm just gonna focus on what we need to do for this build, and I'll put a link to that video in the description if you wanna find out more. So first thing to do is open the door for the tempered glass panel. We need to pull the handle at the front, that will let the door swing open, and then we can lift it up and away. Same thing for the other tempered glass side panel. So we'll open the door, and this one from memory is a little bit stiffer, so it's just a matter of wiggling it up and down until it comes off. We've got some magnetic cable covers at the back, so we can open the doors and then lift the panels up and away. To remove our top panel, we've got a thumb screw at the back, which we need to loosen, and then we can slide the panel backwards and lift away. We've got a bracket for our power supply, which is held on with two thumb screws, so we'll remove that. We've got some hard drive cages at the bottom, which we're not going to need for the build, and it's going to make more space for our power supply and cables if we remove it. So we've got two thumb screws at the bottom to remove. We're then going to be able to slide towards us, lift it up, and out. The other hard drive cage, we need to slide all the way to the back, and then we're going to be able to lift it up and out. The next step is optional. I'm going to remove the rear fan because it doesn't have any ARGB on it, and I'll replace it later in the build. Next, we can insert the motherboard into the case, line it up with the standoffs beneath. And then we can secure the motherboard into place with nine screws from the case accessory box. Next, we can slide the cable cover bar over to the position we want to have it in. And actually, for this ATX motherboard, all the way over to the left-hand side works well. And then we'll secure it into place by tightening the two thumb screws at the back. Next thing to do is get our case cables plugged in. Our HD audio header is going to go into this header down the bottom left-hand side of the motherboard. So we'll bring it through the cutout and plug it in with the text facing up the way. Three headers along, we've got one of this case's three ARGB headers, and we're going to plug the cable coming from our case's built-in controller into it. Next to that, we've got a fan header, and the case's three front fans are already connected up to a triple splitter cable, which will get plugged into here. At the bottom right-hand side of the motherboard, we've got our front panel connectors, so we'll bring the cable through, and we're going to plug it in with the power switch text facing up the way. Then we've got our USB Type-C cable, so we'll bring the cable through the cutout, line it up with the header, and push into place. Just above that, we've got our USB 3.0 header, so we'll bring the cable through the cutout, line it up, and push into place. For the power supply, I'm going to be using a fully modular gold power supply from Deepcool. It's the PQ1000M. I've gone ahead and plugged the cables into our power supply that we're going to need. So I've plugged in a 24-pin cable. We've got two 8-pin EPSs. We're going to need one 8-pin and one 4-pin. We've got three 8-pin PCIe cables, and we've got a SATA cable to provide power to our ARGB controller that's built into our case. I've also plugged white cable extensions into the cables as well. We can then secure the case's power supply bracket to our power supply. Just before we put the power supply in the case, this power supply has a hybrid mode, so when the power supply is under low load, its fan stops spinning. So we're going to want to have this turned on, which the switch is in its current position. So I've gone ahead and pulled all the power supply cables through this cutout at the back, and we're going to take care to install the power supply with the fan facing down the way, where it's going to get cooler from underneath the case. So we can simply just slide that in at the back. And then it's just a simple matter of tightening up the thumb screws at the back to secure the power supply. We need to plug our power cables in, and we've got an 8-pin and 4-pin EPS cable at the top left of the motherboard. So we'll bring them through the cutout, line them up with the headers, and push into place. We've then got some cable combs on the cable we can use to help organise the cables. Our 24-pin cable is going to go into here, so we'll bring it through the cutout, line it up with the header, and push into place. And again, we're just going to tidy up the cables with the included cable combs. And we just need to plug the SATA cable coming from our case's built-in ARGB controller into the SATA cable from our power supply. For case fans, I'm going to be using BQuad's Light Wings, and I've got a triple pack of 140mm fans, so I'm going to put one at the rear, two at the top, all set to exhaust. So let's go ahead and get them screwed into place. We can then replace the top panel. Coming from each of our fans, we have two different connectors. I'm going to start off with the four pin PWM connectors. Now, we do have three system fan headers left in this motherboard, so we can plug them in individually. But I do have a spare triple splitter cable sitting about, so I'm just going to plug them into that. So, all we need to do is plug each of the four pin connectors into the triple splitter cable. And that's just going to leave us one four pin PWM connector to plug into a system fan header. So, I'm just going to pass this through the cutout here and get it plugged into the system fan header. The other cable coming from each of our system fans is a 3-pin 5-volt ARGB cable, 
but thankfully we've got a splitter cable so we're going to be able to daisy chain all the fans together. Okay so I'm going to take the cable from our second fan and plug it into the first fan and then the cable from our third fan into our second fan. Now we could of course just plug this into an ARGB header on our motherboard as our motherboard has three but it probably makes sense to get everything plugged into the controller at the front of the case so the buttons in the front of the case will control the lighting on all the fans. So we've got these additional connectors which we can plug into so we remove the protective cover and then all we need to do is line the headers up and push into place. To install our graphics card we need to remove the second and third expansion slot cover. We can then open the clip in the top PCIe slot on the motherboard. For the graphics card I'm going to be using the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 3080. We can then line our graphics card up with the slot and once we're happy everything's lined up it's just some firm pressure and the graphics card will slot into place. And then we can secure the graphics card into place with the screws we've just removed. We can then bring our PCIe cables to the cutout at the bottom and get them plugged into the graphics card. And again we can tidy up the cables using the included cable combs. Last thing to do is some cable management, but we're absolutely spoiled with a number of Velcro straps here, so this should be fairly straightforward. So that's the build complete and I'm obviously delighted with how it turned out. Don't worry if you need to know how to set up the PC, I'm going to cover all that at the end of the video. From installing Windows, the drivers, getting the RGB software set up, updating the BIOS and adjusting the BIOS settings. I don't want to put people off by showing that now and you to miss the benchmarks because that's the bit I want to share with you now. So starting off with the temperatures, our 7900X idled at 43 degrees and reached a maximum of 88 degrees during a 10 minute idle 64 stability test. You can see our CPU reached a maximum frequency of 5.6 gigahertz and during the stability test it was running consistently between 5.1 and 5.3 gigahertz. The RTX 3080 idled at 30 degrees and reached a maximum of 68 degrees. Because I had all the fans running at quite a low speed we had excellent noise levels with only 32 decibels of noise at idle and 43 decibels of noise under load. So a fairly impressive temperatures and noise levels, the Dark Rock Pro 4 did a great job of keeping our 7900X cool and preventing any throttling during the stress test. Taking a look at Cinebench R23, we had a multi-core score of 28,738 and a single core score of 2006. In TimeSpy, we got a CPU score of 14,636, a GPU score of 16,849, and an overall score of 16,475. Moving on to the gaming benchmarks, and all games were tested at a resolution of 3440 by 1440 with graphics settings set to high. Starting off with Fortnite, we had an average frame rate of 175. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, using the game's built-in benchmark, we had an average frame rate of 185. In Far Cry 6, again using the game's built-in benchmark, we had an average frame rate of 115. And finally in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, again using the game's built-in benchmark, we had an average frame rate of 86. So really impressive numbers, this is an absolute beast of a PC, and importantly I think this is one of my easiest build guides to follow. Putting it together in this case was really straightforward, and again if you want to go with a different Ryzen 7000 processor or a different GPU, you should be able to follow along to this build guide without making really any significant changes. So if you have enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, remember to hit the subscribe button. And if you want to know how to set up the PC, hang about and I'll talk you through that now. Okay, so that's the build complete. I'm now going to show you how to set the PC up. So importantly, I have loaded a Windows 11 bootable USB drive into the back of the PC. If you don't know how to make one of those, I've made a video on it and you'll find a link to that video in the description. So we need to flip the power switch and see what happens. So that's a good sign, the fans are spinning and we've got lights on the PC, so we're just going to have to keep an eye on the screen and see what happens. So there we go, we're through to the Windows installer screen, so I'll show you how to set up Windows 11. Okay, I'm from the United Kingdom, I'm going to click Next. 
I'm going to click install now. If you've got a Windows product key, put it in here. If you don't have one, click I don't have a product key. Select the version of Windows you're going to get a product key for in the future. I'm going to select Windows 11 Pro and click next. I'm going to accept the license terms. We're going to go for a custom install. If you've got more than one drive, pick the drive you want to install Windows onto. So we'll click next. Okay, over the next lot of screens, I'm going to pick the options that are relevant to me. If you have different options, pick the ones that apply to you. I'm from the United Kingdom. I'm going to click yes. And again, yes for the keyboard layout. I don't want a secondary keyboard, so I'm going to click skip. We're going to have to name the device. Then we can click next. We're going to set up for personal use. Click next. If you've got a Microsoft ID, you can put it in here. If you don't, you can create one. Or what I'm going to do is go for an offline option. So I'm going to click on sign in options. And I'm going to go for offline account. It's going to warn me that it's not as good. I'm going to go skip for now. And then I just need to enter my name. I'm going to need to create a password and set up three security questions. I'm going to let apps use my location. Click accept. Yes for find my device. Um, just the required data. No thinking. No again. And no again. Okay, that's us through to Windows and we're getting a pop-up from ASRock's auto driver installer. So we're going to click on yes. And this is really going to simplify the driver installation process. We're going to accept the terms and click continue and click yes. So what it's going to do, it's going to go off and find the latest version of the drivers that we're going to need. So it's found the chipset driver, the HD audio driver and the LAN driver. And we're just going to click on update and it's going to automatically do the installation for us. It's warning us the computer may need to reboot a number of times, but all we're going to need to do is reboot and it's going to come back in here and then install the next driver. Okay, so that's let us know that all the drivers have been installed. We can go ahead and click on OK. There is one more driver that we need to install and that's for our graphics cards. So we're going to need to head over to NVIDIA's webpage. Um, you'll find links to everything in the description. I've already filled this in for R3080 and I'm going to click on search. We're going to click download and download. We can then head over to our downloads folder. Click yes. OK. So we've got a couple of options here. We can either install the driver by itself or the driver plus the GeForce Experience. So I'll show you the GeForce Experience. We're going to click Agree and Continue. And we're going to go for an Express installation. Click Next. OK, we're going to need to restart our computer to complete the installation. We can then open the GeForce Experience. We're going to need to sign in. I'll put my details in. OK, so the advantage of installing the GeForce Experience is it's going to be able to update the drivers for you. And it'll prompt you when there's new versions available. If we click on Driver, um, we can see we've already got our driver installed for the games. If you use your computer mostly for content creation, you can click over here and select the studio driver. Um, I'm going to be testing games on this, so I'm going to leave it as the game ready driver. Next thing I want to do is get Windows fully up to date. So we click on the Windows icon, click on the settings, and we're going to go ahead and click on Windows update. What it's going to do, it's going to find a whole load of updates. So we're going to click on download now. So what we're going to do is let it install all the updates. It might need to restart a number of times, but we're going to keep coming back here until there's no further updates available. Okay, that's Windows fully up to date. Whenever I click on check for updates, there's no more available. The next thing I want to do is show you how to set up the RGB. At the moment, everything apart from the graphics card is being controlled by our case controller because we plugged our additional fans into the extra headers coming from the controller. What we could do is sync it up with the motherboard because we have plugged a cable from the case controller into the motherboard, but we've got lots of nice effects on the controller, so I'm happy with it. So if we press the M button, it's going to cycle through a range of dynamic effects, but what I'm actually looking for is a static white. So it's the C button that I'm going to want to press, and you'll notice it cycles through a range of different colors as I press it. Okay, so that's the white I was looking for, and you'll notice that everything in the PC has changed to white apart from the graphics card. So there's additional software that we're going to need to be able to adjust the graphics card's RGB. Next thing I want to do is get our RGB software set up. So we head over to our graphics cards page and we're going to scan down and we're looking for the Armory Crate. So we're going to click on Download. We can then open the file. And we're going to extract all. Extract. And yes. So it's going to ask us what we want to install, to either the Armory Crate or the Armory Crate and Aurora Creator. So I'm happy with just the Armory Crate and we'll click on Start. Okay, we need to click Reopen Up, click Next, scan down to the bottom and click I Agree. And we're going to skip the wallpaper and click on Cancel. So we can go over to Aura Sync and it's going to have picked up our graphics card. So we're going to want to click on the Aura Effects 
And at the moment, it's set to rainbow. And if you look at the graphics card, it has the rainbow effect on it. I wanted to have a static white to match the rest of the colors in the PC. So we click on static. It's currently set to red. So all we need to go into here and enter 255 and 255 and click OK. And that's our graphics card set to white and it matches the rest of the RGB in the system. Next thing I want to do is come over to our motherboards page over on ASRock's website and I'll head down to the support and then the download tab. This is where you're going to come to get any additional drivers that you need. Um, obviously some of our drivers were installed at the start but there is additional programs here you may well want. Um, for example, if you want to control the RGB software through the motherboard headers, you're going to need an ASRock Polychrome to allow you to do that. I'm happy enough with the basic and drivers for now, but what I do want to do is download the latest version of the BIOS. Because we're going to head over to the BIOS now and I'm going to show you how to update it. Um, I'm going to update it to 1.07. So I'm going to click on Download. And then if we head over to our Downloads folder, and we can double click on the BIOS version, this is the file, so we're going to copy that and I've plugged in an external hard drive and I'm going to paste it onto this. At the end of the BIOS, what we're going to need to do is click on the Windows icon, click on the power button and click on Restart. Whenever the screen goes black, we're going to want to start pressing Delete on the keyboard and that should take us into the BIOS. So take a look at the BIOS, we can see we've got version 1.01. .01. So I'm going to go ahead and update that before I do anything else. So you click on Tool and we're going to click on Instant Flash and click Yes. To find the version of the BIOS on our USB drive, we're going to click on Update and click Yes. So it's really important you don't lose power during the update because you can, you can brick your motherboard and in general you should really only be updating the BIOS if the new version offers features that you're going to need or if you're having problems with your PC. Obviously we've got a new platform and I've got an early sample version of this motherboard I'm keen to update it to the latest version so we can get the best performance out of our CPU. Okay, that's us back into the BIOS and we can see we're running the latest version 1.07. The first thing I want to do is get our memory running at the correct speed because it's only running at 4800 MHz where it can run at 52. So we click on OC Tweaker, we're going to click on DRAM Profile Configuration and then we're going to change Auto to XMP Profile Number 1. Next thing I want to do is check resizable bars enabled. So we click on Advanced, PCI Configuration, and we can see resizable bar has been enabled. Last thing I want to do is take a look at our fans. So we head over here, we can see our CPU fan 1, the speed it's running at, and our other fans are currently in chassis fan number 2, and chassis fan number 4 is where we've plugged our two groups of fans into. So we'll head down and take a look at them. The CPU fan is currently running in silent mode. I'm just going to change that over to standard mode. And then if we head down and take a look at the chassis fans. So chassis fan number two is also running in silent mode, monitoring the motherboard. Let's change that over to standard mode. I'll leave it monitoring the motherboard for now. It's not going to ramp up and down as much um, as what it will do if we set it to running off the CPU. If our temperatures aren't good, what I'll do is I'll change this to monitor the CPU and the fans will then ramp up as the CPU temperatures increase. And exactly the same thing with chassis fan number four. I'm just going to change it to the standard mode. So to save our changes, we can click on exit and save changes and exit. Yes, and the PC will reboot into Windows. So the next thing I want to do is check that those settings have been enabled. So if we right click on the Windows icon, click on Task Manager, and then we're going to click on More Details and Performance and Memory, we can see we've got 32 gigabytes of memory running at 5200 megahertz. To check we've got the resizable bar enabled, we need to go down to the NVIDIA settings. We're going to agree and continue, and we're going to go into System Information. And then if we look here, resizable bar is enabled, so we can close this down. Okay, so that's the PC up and running just the way I wanted. Remember, if you have enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. And I'll see you in the next video.